at uh, what we what we have here uh, in uh, verses 17 uh, through 24. Our last Lord's Day, uh, in our morning service, uh, we began looking at this parable and we saw together uh, that the mercy of God is prodigious. Now, this parable is often called the parable of the prodigal son and and uh, then you get a focus really on the, the extraordinary uh, hugeness of the sin of the boy. He's a prodigal and his sin is prodigious and often we might think that way. Um, but uh, that's not actually the purpose of the parable at all. The purpose of the parable is to show us uh, the, the character and the nature of the attitude of God uh, towards sinners who return to him. And uh, that attitude is one of mercy, and the mercy of God is what's prodigious in this parable. Uh, if, this, if the boy's sins were very great as he went off to waste his father's abundance to him, just like we do as sinners, we go off and waste all that God's given in the pursuit of the pleasures of sin. If that's a great and a heinous thing, well, how much greater and how much more glorious is the mercy of God that freely receives that boy and forgives all his trespasses and sins and blesses him and throws a party when he returns. How, how much greater is the mercy of God than were the sins of the prodigal? And that's really the purpose of this parable, is to show us that the mercy of God is prodigious and there's delight and joy in the heart of God and in heaven among the angels when any sinner repents, because that's repentance is like coming home from a far country where we're wasting our lives, uh, coming home to God and having God give us a whole new way of living. So the prodigious mercy of God. Now, last week we saw that, that God's mercy is very great, but it's also uh, very powerful, purposeful, and severe at times. And we saw that God will do whatever it takes in his mercy to bring people that are going to be saved to the end of themselves so that they actually say to themselves, it's, it, 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 it's, it's not God who's my problem. Uh, I was fleeing from God and I thought he was like the big uh, uh, wet blanket over life that stopped me having fun before, but I can see now that it's my own sinfulness that's the problem. And my sins, as I follow disobediently against God, the pursuit of the pleasures of this life, that's what's killing me. Now, God will do what it takes to bring people who are going to be saved to the point where they start to look at themselves and say, I need to repent. I need to turn around and go back to God. Now, that's what we've looked at. God did what it took. He brought that boy to the place where he had his nose in the pig's trough with the pigs, eating the husks with the pigs. He's obviously got no shoes and his clothes are in tatters. When he gets home to his dad, he's... His father has to say to him, give him shoes, give him clothes and shoes. He's in a complete state of disrepair. His life is ruined, it seems. But no life is ruined. Not ultimately, when it's possible, to return to God. So let's just look this morning a bit more at this mercy of God and uh, focusing particularly on that mercy. And we'll see that it's... Uh, it's a very lovely, attractive thing, the mercy of God. It's winsome. That's a word we like to use in the Christian church. It's winsome. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's sweet. It's attractive. It's a little bit like a powerful magnetic force that's drawing people who have come to see that they need a saviour 
uh, irresistibly towards God. The mercy of God is like that. So we'll see, first of all, it's winsome. Then we'll, we'll see how God shows that mercy to people. It's manifest. And then thirdly, we'll see that there's no real limit to the mercy of God. It's got no bounds. It's prodigal, prodigious. It's unbounded. So first of all, then, uh, the winsome mercy of God. Now, if someone said to you, describe for me, please, the mercy of God, how would you go, do you think? What would you say? It's a very, very wonderful thing to think about. It's worth just turning all the media off and shutting the books and putting your feet up in your chair when you get home and close your eyes and just meditate on what the Word of God says about mercy. Well, so much could be said, but let's go at it this way this morning. Divine mercy, because we're talking about the mercy of God, there and this is, the, this is the source and the origin of all good and mercy. It's God himself. Divine mercy is that beautiful perfection of God, that attribute of God that aims purposefully and powerfully and lovingly and righteously at bringing his elect children home to himself willingly and bringing them through a change of heart so they get up and leave their destructive ways and come home to him and he will bring them out of their deepest misery through this marvellous process of conversion. He'll bring them out of their deepest misery and into the highest possible happiness for a human being, that's mercy. Now, nothing less than that really does any justice to the mercy of God. And we talk about mercy in, amongst human beings, and uh, let me just give you a very practical example. Uh, as parents, some of us uh, will have seen our children become prodigal, and uh, and our hearts will break. Uh, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see them head off out of all the abundance of the goodness of the Christian faith and, and the knowledge of God and the hope of heaven through Jesus Christ. We'll see them head off out of that into a far country and start to waste all their substance. Our hearts will break. We'll feel a tremendous sense of compassion for them. We'll, we'll have a tremendous desire to be able to help them and to bring them home. We'll, we'll say to ourselves, I would do almost anything. In fact, I would do anything to be able to turn this about and bring them out of that utter misery and ruin that they're going into and home into the happiness and the hope of heaven. But we can't. We can't. Because our mercy is human mercy. It's limited mercy. It, it, it's mercy that turns our stomach over with compassion. It breaks our heart. It brings tears from our eyes. It makes us, so we do almost anything, and we do. We try anything, but we can't touch the heart of our child. What could change their heart? What could bring them home? That takes more than our mercy and our compassion. That takes the mercy of God. Only God, the mighty God of providence who orders people's lives and can bring them to absolute nothing. And the God who by his Holy Spirit is able to reach down through the outward distress and circumstances of life and open the eyes, you could say, of the spiritual understanding so our children, prodigals, begin to see the reality of life as it actually is. And they start, like, in the terms of the parable, they come to themselves. That's God's mercy. God's mercy is a mighty, irresistible power of love that is able to do what it takes to bring miserable sinners out of the despair and ruin 
and into and through the Lord Jesus Christ and into the hope of heaven and ultimately into heaven itself and into the eternal uninterrupted blessedness and joy of communion with God in his love with the absolute overwhelming goodness of God filling the soul and leaving no space for anything else besides. Complete satisfaction with God. That's what mercy aims at. <laughs> Nothing less than that is doing any justice to the mercy of God in the Bible. Now, when Ever God works that way in a human being, a fallen, sinful human being like you and me and our children, and indeed every other sinner in the world. Whenever God works that way, uh, he's always going to bring his children home to him willingly. He never, ever drags someone by the hair screaming and kicking uh, into heaven. He always brings his beloved children home to him willingly. Now, that is where the winsomeness, the attractiveness, the magnetic appeal of God's mercy comes in. God will move us so that we come to him as people who genuinely desire uh, to be forgiven, uh, to be accepted, to have a new life, and to receive it from him. And so whenever the promise of the gospel, uh, whenever the mercy of God in Jesus Christ is held forth before sinners in the world, it always comes either in the express words or with this idea around it, whosoever will, let him come. And there's always going to be the willingness created in a human soul to draw us to God. Uh, you, might, you might remember that uh, beautiful passage in Revelation 22, verse 17. So it's like the conclusion of the Bible. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst Come. It's amazingly wonderfully free, isn't it? Come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. And so God is going to work in our souls, in our hearts, so that we will say, I want to come. I want to go home. I want to draw near to God. I want to be restored. I will come to God willingly. Now, that's God's great purpose. So whosoever believes in him shall have everlasting life. That's the way of the gospel promise. Whosoever will, let him come. Now, that being the case, and I hope as you run your mind over the Bible, you can see with me that that actually is the case. Test what you hear by the Bible. And if it's true, then it's absolutely God speaking to you. Uh, no ifs and buts, it will change your life completely. But now that being true, it, it is also true that something has to change the way the prodigal son was thinking about life before he'd ever go home willingly, doesn't it? I mentioned just in passing that the Holy Spirit works in people's hearts to open the eyes of the understanding so they see things differently. But that takes place very really and practically and personally in people's lives. And what has to happen in our lives if we're ever going to return to God is that something has to change the things we love. Something has to change the things that we think make us happy. Because that's what had to happen for this boy. He thought it would make him happy 
It would give him fulfillment in life and contentment and satisfaction and that, and that sense of, hey, things are just the way they ought to be, as happy as I could be. He thought that what would give him that was to take all his father's money, all his inheritance, and spend it on riotous living. And if you put that into modern day terms, that's like someone who's grown up knowing God and then in the knowledge of the Christian faith, uh, taking all the great privileges and equipment that God's given them through that instruction and going out into life and just doing whatever feels good. Now, that might be very different for different people. For some, that will take them into the nightclub and the lifestyle uh, that comes with, with, with all the debauchery of our society. Uh, they'll be out there sleeping around. They'll be out there taking pills and drugs and shooting stuff up into their arms and smoking it. And they'll be pouring alcohol down their throats till they're staggering drunk and they'll be going home and sleeping with whoever they meet, like so many Australians are doing. They think that'll make them happy. Others will take the great privileges that they've had and they'll go off and become extraordinarily successful business people. And they'll give themselves to that and they'll think it'll make them happy. I'll get rich, I'll get famous, I'll be able to buy this, I'll be able to buy that, I'll be able to travel here, I'll be able to travel there, and they do. And as they do, they look around and they get a bit older and their wife has left them and they're estranged from their children and they wake up one day and they think to themselves, what was life all about? Whatever your poison is, whatever makes you happy, the human being we will pursue it with all that we are. Now, whatever can turn that around? Well, two things, and they're all part of repentance. First of all, we've got to learn that the things we thought were good and were giving us pleasure are actually bad and are destroying us. So that's that's critically important. And, and in that process, Go, we go from thinking that this is good to realising that this is bad and, and there's a change taking place. And in that process, we begin to see that it's not only bad and destructive to me, it's not only the consequences are bad, it's the thing itself that's bad. And like this prodigal said, he comes to himself and he says, my life's a mess, yes, that's the consequences, but here's the cause. I've sinned. I have disobeyed God, and this is a problem between me and God. This is a spiritual, moral problem between me and God. I have sinned against heaven and against my Father. Now, that's the change. What sin offers in its pleasures becomes an evil. That's repentance. We die to the love of sin. And it's an awfully painful process for some people. And God, remember, will do what it takes to bring people to that point. If they're going to be saved, you'll bring them to that point. Sin is the great evil. Sin is the thing I've got to escape. I've got to be forgiven. I've got to be delivered from it. And I'm turning from it. Then. In that process, he remembers his father and the winsome mercy of God opens up before him. Instead of sin and its pleasures being the great good, something else is becoming the great good. God, his goodness, his mercy, his love for sinners through Jesus Christ his ability to forgive and his ability to make our life new and, and reconstruct us from the inside out and, and make everything marvelously good and give you the hope of eternity as well. It comes into the picture. And that God, what he is, and because it's always inseparable for us as creatures, 
what he gives. What he is, what he gives through Jesus Christ. That becomes the great good. And so repentance turns from the sin. And it turns towards God with an apprehension, with an, with an awareness that there's mercy with God for sinners like me. And that merciful God becomes like a magnet that's drawing my little piece, uh, a filing of steel irresistibly towards it. It's winsome. It's all my hope, says the sinner. It's light in the end of the tunnel. It's the one thing that would hope, keep me from despairing. It's the one thing that would stay my hand from wanting to end my life. The, there's mercy with God. And it's so gloriously attractive that it puts feet under the soul, as it were. And, and brings the prodigal on his journey home to God. I've got a question for you. Don't despair. I've asked myself this question. Have you got anything like that in your life by way of true experience of conversion? Do you ever really come to see yourself as a prodigal wasteling and the thing you're pursuing in life that gives you so much pleasure, whatever it is, is something that you should actually break with because you hate it? Have you ever come to that? Not just because of the consequences, but because it's actually evil in itself. And has your heart Come to behold the glorious goodness of God's mercy to you as a sinner that gives you hope that you can be forgiven and that you can be restored. Have you ever come anywhere near that? Or have you just sort of gone on in your life in the church knowing about God and thinking that going through religion is all that there is, and you've never ever come through that experience, the true conversion. You think about that. Because the person who has not come through repentance and faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, and to God in him, is in a far off land. That's where they live. And if that's you, then you need to return to the Lord. That's one of the things this, product, this parable of the prodigal will give to us, isn't it? You need to behold, as a sinner, the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. Because if you do, as a sinner, you will not be able to resist him. You will come to him willingly, wholeheartedly, and it will transform your life. So don't leave that one here in church. Take that home with you. Pack that in your pocket. Take it home. Think about it. It, it. And as you can answer the question, yes, God has done that for me, there'll be immense comfort for your soul. But if you can't, take no comfort for your soul. It doesn't belong to you. Come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ in faith and repentance. And then you'll meet the merciful God. Well, I think we're going to leave that there this morning. That's enough for us to think on. We'll come back to this next Lord's Day. So uh, let's close briefly with a word of prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for, for a few moments that we can think about these vitally important things. Uh, Lord, we don't want religion as a thing in itself. We don't even want the Christian religion as a thing in itself. Uh, we want to come uh, through the true Christian religion 
uh, all the way home through repentance and faith into your arms as our Heavenly Father. So, Lord, have mercy on us and our children. Gather us up from a far country and uh, bring us into the joy of that uh, wonderful mercy and the party, uh, the happiness uh, that belongs to those who return to the Lord with all their hearts. And for those, Lord, among us who for many years have, have indeed having been brought to you like prodigals in the past, we find ourselves living in your house. Restore to us, we pray, the joy of our salvation, our first love. Uh, make it live as a great and glorious blessing of God in our lives and enable us to have a sense of the overwhelming and glorious goodness of your mercy towards us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And for us all, Lord, help us remember that that mercy which is for sinners has been purchased by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross for the greatest possible price. It is of the greatest possible worth and help us value it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, let's... Uh...